started. Um, we're going to have a recitation session today. And we're just going to cover a few different things. Um, it'll probably be a, a short session, um, so you can have more time to work on the lab if you're still working on that. Uh, so lab five is due tonight at midnight, though I think you actually still have quite a few late days in some cases. So keep working on that. If you've submitted it already, great. Um, we'll be going over the grade distribution for lab four today, and we'll be posting those grades soon. They might have been posted already. Um, not yet, OK. So they'll be posted soon. And I'll be going over a couple of questions from homework five that I think are representative of what you might see on the next midterm or um, final. They might make some reappearance in a different form, or they're just kind of reverse engineering and, and interesting to go through. So we'll go through a couple of those problems um, just to prepare you for that. and then. We'll take any questions on lab five that you might have, but what I really want to try and get to is lab six. Now, lab six is going to be posted soon. I don't know if Yungu posted that already, but it's getting to the point where it's gonna start getting you know, even harder. We keep saying this, each lab is getting harder and harder. It's gotten to the point where I actually want to talk a little bit about it in class to give you a jump start so that when you actually get to working on it, you'll already have that sort of information in your head so you can get you can hit the ground running okay so that's what we'll be uh, talking about today like I said it should be relatively short so lab four let's start there with the uh, distribution the average was 78 um, percent a lot of people got full credit on that lab so we tested it using the same uh, testing inputs that were used in the previous version of this course, it was basically, so when this course was taught by James Ho, students submitted lots of different test inputs, and those were actually compiled together into this one big like, uh, input pool. And so that's what we were using to test your code in addition to the, um, the instructions that we initially tested for lab two, so just to check and make sure that you had fixed any latent bugs in your code. So that's what we were basically using, um, and most people did really well on this, so that's good. Um, we'll be announcing the winners of the extra credit assignment, uh, most likely in Monday's lecture. And what we basically did for that is because some people used a memory module that you can't actually synthesize, what we're just going to do is compare the simulated run length, which is kind of analogous to branch prediction accuracy because if you have to squash things, then you'll have to spend a larger number of cycles, regardless of your critical path, executing that code. So that's what we'll be comparing, just for the extra credit. OK, any questions on lab four? OK, well, that's all I'm going to use the board for, for today. So we're done with that, or sorry, the, the projector four. OK, let's move on to homework five. Let me just put these up. OK, so I picked two questions from homework five that I thought were kind of interesting and that I wanted to talk about and, and sort of just walk you through on the board. So this is going to be question four, virtual memory, and question six on caching. Both of these are kind of reverse engineering type problems in nature. They involve really understanding how the system is working and being able to sort of figure out what's going on and how did you get to that state and or how would you, you know, infer different aspects of the system. So let's just walk through those. Okay, so starting with uh, question four. So we have virtual memory. An ISA supports an 8-bit byte addressable virtual address space. The corresponding physical memory has only 128 bytes, okay? Each page contains 16 bytes. A simple one-level translation scheme is used, and the page table resides in physical memory. The initial contents of the frames of physical memory are shown below. So let's take a look at that. So we have a frame number, and we're going to have a frame content. Remember, we said that physical pages, you can 
call them also physical frames. So that's the notation that's used in this problem. And because we're given the size of the memory and the size of pages, we can actually write them all on the board. This one is currently empty. Just so I don't confuse myself. That one's empty. This one is page 13, 5, 2, empty, 0, empty. And the page table is actually located in this physical frame. So that's where the contents of the page table is stored. We have a three-entry translation look-aside buffer that uses least recently used replacement on this system. So let's draw that as well. So we'll have the TLB, which will contain some virtual to physical translation for three different pages. Um, so we'll just put the virtual page numbers in the, in the TLB here, three entries. And it's least recently used, so we have some sort of age associated with each of these entries. And we can use this to make replacement decisions. Um, initially, the TLB contains entries for pages 0, 2, and 13. 0, 2, 13, OK. This makes sense because these pages are, are mapped in physical memory. OK, quick sanity check. For the following sequence of references, put a circle around those that generate a TLB hit and a rectangle around those that generate a page fault. OK, so what would a TLB hit mean? That would mean that we go to access a virtual page, and we have its translation cached in the TLB. That means that we can just quickly access physical memory and grab the data that we need. If we have a TLB miss, that doesn't necessarily generate a page fault because we might just have the page located in physical memory already, we just need to cache its translation in the TLB. A page fault happens when you both miss in the TLB and your page isn't located in main memory. Then you have to go fetch it from disk. Remember we talked about you have to perform a direct memory access to move the contents into memory, and then you can keep operating on your data and update the TLB. Okay, so the question is, what is the hit rate of the TLB for the sequence of references? So let's look at that sequence. We have 0, 13, 5, 2, 14, 14, 13, 6, 6, 13, 15, 14, 15, 13, 4, 3. And I think what I'll do is I'll just go through a few of these until you can get a flavor for how this system is operating. And you can look at the rest and, and complete those on your own if, if you happen to um, miss this part of the problem. OK, so let's start out here. So we have 0. In fact, maybe you can help me fill this in. So we have a reference to 0. What's going to happen in the system? What will we do? TLB hit. Yeah, it's a TLB hit. So what we'll do is the processor will first check the TLB. Maybe it does this in parallel with issuing a request that it could later like cancel or something like that. But it'll definitely check the TLB. And it'll notice that the virtual to physical translation for page 0 is located in the TLB. So that's great. We can actually just perform the translation quickly and get the data. Um, let's set this age to 1. I don't know. So we'll say like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, something like that. So we just accessed page 0. So this was actually a TLB hit. So we'll circle that. OK, 13, same thing, right? We look in the TLB, and we find out that 13 is actually the, the translation is cached. Great, so we'll update the age here. This was a TLB hit. What about 5, though? What happens when we go to access virtual address 5? So when you say go to memory, what does that involve? I guess the actual sticking it in the TLB isn't as much. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, so, yeah so, so let's just quickly go over what happens when you have a TLB miss. So what you'll do is you'll look in the TLB. If the data isn't stored there, what you're going to do is you're going to use that special register. Remember we talked about in Intel systems, it's called CR3. 
or whatever register you're using on your architecture, you'll figure out where is the page table located in physical memory, and you'll start reading the contents of the page table and figure out where what data is present in memory, whether it's read-only, write-only, whether it's located on disk, things like that. So what we would do is we would miss in the TLB, we would read the page table, we would inspect the page table, figure out is virtual address 5 currently located in physical memory? And what the page table would tell us is that yes, it is located in physical memory and its mapping is to physical frame 2. So what we could do here is we could actually, we, we could basically say, okay, now I know that virtual address 5 maps to physical frame 2 and I can update the TLB with that information. So good, we didn't have a page fault, but we still didn't hit in the TLB. We had to walk the page table. That still takes some time, but not as bad as going to disk. Um, I guess we can assume that since this address wasn't accessed in the, the time that we've seen, we can just assume that it's the oldest and replace it with 5. And this one was accessed third. OK. OK, so that's good. Hey, I have a quick question. So we didn't actually test this on this problem, but what would happen if as you were you know, updating the, the contents of main memory, what if your page manager in the operating system decided that it wanted to store you know, the physical page that's associated with virtual page 13 to disk? What would happen? What would you have to do to the TLB? Because now what happened is your page that you were mapping in the TLB just got kind of silently transferred to disk. And now this mapping doesn't make sense anymore. What would you do? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So that's normally the, the colloquial term for that is called a TLB shoot down. So what you can actually do is you can, the operating system can tell the hardware, I just moved this physical page out of memory. Look through the TLB and if there were any mappings for that physical page, you need to invalidate them because they don't hold anymore. So that's what you would do. Bit of a side note, but um, that's, that's also another interesting interaction with the TLB. Okay, so that was good. We resolved this. We didn't have a page fault. What about for page two? What happens here? What happens to two? Well, we look at the TLB. We just had two in there, so it's kind of a shame that we just removed it, but there's nothing that we can really do about that. We're using LRU policy, so we're not able to hit in the TLB, but luckily we're, it's located in main memory. Okay, that's good. And let, let's, let's do address 14. So address 14 is where things start to get a little bit interesting. So for virtual address 14, we look in the TLB. OK, it's not located there. We look in, we start walking the page table, and what we find is that virtual address 14 isn't even mapped to a physical frame. So this means that we have to actually issue a page fault, go to disk, get the memory, bring it into memory. I don't know. We could put it here. This isn't empty anymore. And we could actually update the mapping in the TLB now and say that, OK, virtual address 14 is located here. This was the oldest entry. Put virtual address 14's translation there and give it an updated age. This happened to be a page fault. So we'll give it a square. And the next time we access it, we can hit the TLB. Yes? Mike. Wasn't zero replaced with two? So the way that we have it now, we would have ended up with uh, 2, 5, 14 as our TLB yeah. when we got uh, to that point. When you say was? So we, when we went and we accessed um, page 2, or yes. frame 2 in the last yes. step, we didn't update the TLB with 2. Uh, so yes. we replaced it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yes, thanks, Mike. So actually, 2 would have gone here, right? And that would have been 4. And then we would have actually replaced 13, yes, thank you, with 14. Good. That would have been 5. OK, thanks. OK, so 
this is fairly algorithmic once you understand the workings of the machine. Things could get a little bit more complex So if, you, if we start to think about what could be on the midterm or final. What if we give you like a multi-level page table and interactions with that? What if we start to introduce different sort of status bits for each of the um, pages and multiple threads that are maybe sharing data and we have aliasing that's going on. So these are potential directions that you might want to think about in the context of this question. How would I modify this or change this if I were you know, going forward toward the exam? OK, so that's that question, which is fairly interesting. Um, oh, and, and so you can basically go through and to calculate the hit rate, what you'll do is you'll look at the number of hits and you'll divide that by the total number of accesses. That'll be your TLB hit rate. Um, and then if you just keep working through this, you'll be able to figure out what the final contents of the TLB was. If we just stopped here, th these would be the final contents, these translations. Um, and same thing with the physical frames. You can keep inserting the pages into the physical address space, and you'll be able to figure out what's the contents. Now, there's one subtlety that I actually didn't include here, which you'll need to perform eventually, which is you'll also need some sort of age information associated with the way that physical frames are being accessed because we're doing some sort of replacement policy. Now, the question itself was a little bit ambiguous as to how we were managing physical memory itself. Um, I think the implicit answer was that we were just using an LRU replacement policy with a fully associative organization. That means that the OS can choose to replace any one of these pages. It doesn't have any restrictions based on the address of them. So if you use those assumptions, you can basically perform replacements, and you'll get the final contents of, of main memory. OK. So that was that question. Um, it's a little bit straightforward once you start, once you, once you understand the workings of the system. But there are a lot of little just simple tweaks that you can perform to it that can make it a lot more complex. So keep a lookout for those. Let's go on to caching right now. So this caching question um, is a little bit tricky because you have to, you're, you're given an access stream. And based on that, you actually have to figure out the properties of the cache itself. And it's one of those things where I guess in retrospect, you can kind of see, I mean, it's a reverse engineering problem. So in retrospect, you can see, okay, well, that makes sense, that makes sense. When you're actually doing this on the midterm or the final, you know, you're pressured for time, right? So you really have to be able to figure out, OK, this part of the question was placed here for this specific reason, and I'm going to use that to help me get closer toward the answer. So let's go through and kind of decode this question. So we give you four different sequences of addresses that are generated by a program running on a processor with a data cache. Okay, cache, The cache hit ratio for each sequence is also given. So that's basically the number of times you hit in the cache divided by the number of accesses in the sequence. Assuming that the cache is initially empty at the beginning of each sequence, find out the following parameters of the processor's data cache. So we're looking for associativity, and we give you a range, one, two, or four ways. Block size, give you a range of those. Total cache size, okay, and replacement policy, least recently used or first in, first out. Um, all memory accesses are one byte accesses, and all addresses are byte addresses. OK, so let's take a look at what's given in the problem. So we have some sort of sequence number, and maybe we have one, we have one, two, three, four, and then we have the actual address sequence. And for that, we have 0, 2, 4, 8, 16. 32, 0, 12. I should probably have this on a projector, huh? Oh, well. 64, 32, 
Okay, so these are our sequences that we're given. And then we're also given the hit ratio for each of these sequences in the cache. That's basically the setup for this problem. Okay. So, um, in the solutions, they actually attack this problem and they figure out the parameters of the cache in a different order than they're listed in the problem description. Now this is intentional because certain sequences give you like definitely positive information that you can use to apply constraints to other sequences that can help you figure out those cache parameters. So we're gonna go through these in the order that they are in the solution. So the first one that is considered, the first parameter is the cache block size. Let's take a look at how that works. Question six. Okay, so for this solution, the sequence that we're going to focus on is sequence one, right? Let's take a look at that for a second. Why might this give you a hint about, why might sequence one give you a hint about cache block size? Well, it's the only, so, so the addresses in sequence one are actually relatively close together compared to the other sequences. In fact, in the other sequences, the addresses are spread apart by larger than the maximum size of the, the cache block that we actually give you in the question. So none of these address sequences can actually give you that much useful information. I guess when there's some reuse, you have some, uh, no, even when there is some reuse, that doesn't tell you anything about the cache block size. So we really want to use this sequence to narrow down, okay, what size are our cache blocks? And the way that I think about this is, I kind of start thinking about, okay, what are the range of sizes that we could have? Let's look at the byte. So we could have, could have basically, if we have address zero, and this is the first zeroth byte, first byte, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, dot, 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 16, dot, 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 32. This is a possible cache block size. This is a possible cache block size. So is this, 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 and this. And we can take a look at that address sequence and start to run through what would actually happen with different sizes. So if we had a size of, let's say a cache block size of one, what would happen? Well, all of those accesses in the sequence would actually be misses because none of them would, uh, accessing one of the bytes doesn't actually bring in any other bytes into your cache. So those would all be misses, okay. If, an, if the cache block size is two, so we would access address zero, that would bring in address one, okay. If we go to access address two, well that doesn't help us. We're just gonna access two and bring in three. If we access address four, same thing. That just brings in five. So even with the cache block size of two, we're not getting any reuse with the cache blocks. Now, what happens if we have a cache block size of four? Okay, let's try that. We'll access zero, we'll bring in four bytes of data. We'll access two, okay, that's a hit actually. So this is getting us maybe a little bit closer to a solution. When we go to access eight, however, we'll access here and we'll bring in eight through um, nine, 10, 11, uh, 11. And when we go to access 16, that actually won't be a hit. We won't have that data in our cache. So, okay, 
We have one hit, basically, for this sequence, not what we're looking for. Let's just go through and try eight, then. So, so you see how we're kind of just, we used one sort of hint in the way that the sequences were presented to narrow down what we needed to look at based on what we know about cache blocks. The size of the cache blocks brings in close by data. Let's look for a sequence that has close by addresses. And then from that point, you kind of just have to try the different possible solutions and figure out which one matches up. OK, so if we do eight, we access zero. We bring in these eight bytes. We access two, hit. We access four, hit. We access eight, hit. And then when we, when we go to access 16 and 32, those are spread apart by more than eight bytes. So we actually won't have any more reuse in the cache. Three hits out of nine accesses, that's our hit rate. Yeah. The eight should be in this. Yes. Ah. Eight should be, eight should be a miss. Because we only hit two out of six. You yes, miss. yes, thank you. Eight is a miss. And 16, eight, and 32 are spread apart by more than eight bytes. Zero index numbers, everyone. OK, so that's the first part of the problem. OK, that's relatively straightforward. So the next part that we start to tackle is looking at associativity. So let's take a look at that. Um, what we're going to use there is sequence two. So we're following the sequences here. Um, I don't know, the first tell that I have when I was looking through this problem is if I want to look at associativity, I want to find a sequence whose addresses will map the most to one particular set in my cache. That's really what I care about. Because to figure out associativity, you need to have a lot of insertions going on so you can eventually get to different replacements. right? And once you start to see what data is being replaced, then you can start to infer about associativity. OK, so we can take a look at sequence Two, perhaps, because if you look at, you know, what uh, let let's let's first take a look at. So this is um, cache block size. Got that, and then associativity. So one thing that helped me get started here is first stepping back for a second and saying, what does my cache look like in terms of how many sets it has, and you know, how many ways it potentially has. Then we can start to answer questions like that. So we're given that the size of the cache is 256 bytes. And we just learned that cache blocks are eight bytes in size. So now we can actually figure out how many cache blocks will fit into the cache. So we can take 256 and divide it by eight bytes. And that'll give us 32 blocks. So if we assumed that the size of the cache was 256 bytes, remember we, we can't assume that it's any particular size at this point. We have two options, 256 or 512. Then the number of blocks in the cache would be 32. If we assume that it's 512 bytes divided by 8 byte blocks, we would have 64 blocks. So take a look. What does this mean? This means that. So, so given a certain address stream, we might have the case that all of those addresses can map to the same set because 60, 60, 32 can multi be multiplied by 2 to get 64. So we can have this case where if we're using modular arithmetic to map addresses to sets, we can actually get some addresses mapping to the same set, hopefully many of them. So from this, we can actually take a look at those sequences again and say, which of those sequences has a lot of addresses mapping to similar sets? Now, a lot of those numbers are, you know, they're kind of relatively power of two-ish or sum of power of two-ish. So for this part of the question, you might actually have to try a couple of things and figure out one that, figure out the odd address out that doesn't map to the same set. Let's say you go through that calculation and you figure out that sequence two, all of those are divisible by 32 and 64. If we do modular arithmetic, we can divide them. And they'll map to the same set. And, the, and in fact, they'll map to set 0 in this cache. Because we have these addresses 
even if we divide them by our cache block size, eight bytes to get kind of a cache block index, we can then go and divide them by 32 or 64 blocks in the cache to figure out which set they'll, they'll map to, okay? So for this example, they're all mapping to set zero here, and what we can do is we can actually just sort of start drawing this set, and maybe, so we have a potential associativity of, it could be like one entry, it could be two entries, two ways, or it could be four ways. And we can start stepping through and evaluating what would actually happen. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Um, if we have, so if we have address zero, that's mapping to the set, let's just assume it's like one way. Let's assume it's a single way. We access address zero, we place it in our set, okay. We access address 512, place it in the set, access address 1024. So you see what's going on here. We're only going to get a hit in our cache when we have back-to-back -back accesses to the same address. So if we have this particular example and we're using one way, we're not gonna get any hits. So one way's out of the question. Let's take a look at two ways. So access address zero, access address 512, access address 1024. Now regardless of whether we're using LRU or FIFO, remember we haven't pinned that down, we're going to replace the same elements in this case. So what did we say? 1024, 1536, 2048, And check it out, we actually have a hit. We access 1536 again. So that's good. The problem is, from that point on, we're not going to access any more addresses in the set. So our maximum hit ratio would be one out of nine. That's not what we're looking for. We can go through the four-way example, but by process of elimination, there's going to be four ways in this set, okay? So that we have, so we figured out this is eight bytes and we have Four ways. Good. Okay, so now we've pinned down a couple more parameters. Yeah. I was just gonna say, if you so like you notice the bottom six bits are all clear, which is exactly what it means when you do the modular stuff. Yes. So like you know they're mapping the same set. If you know that to get three hits, you need at least three useful values <clears throat> in the same set at the same time. And the only associativity I can give you that is four ways. So six so, so it doesn't have to be at the same time. Well, remember. just, uh, I've oh, okay, I see what you're saying. You also have to see that it's ascending and only descending. Okay. Which is also the only reason LRU and 5 will be the same. Sure, so if, yeah, so if you take into account more information like the actual access pattern and the actual mapping like we did. Yeah, so, so there's multiple ways of, in fact, that process would have actually been quicker if you could recognize that and, yeah. This is actually the more, I guess, um, I'll, like, like, more brute force way of, of figuring this, this question out. So, you know, in the heat of the midterm, we don't always have, you know, the most elegant solution. But yeah, if you can figure that out and latch onto that, that's great. That's minutes that you're saving that you could spend on another question, right? Okay, good. So let's move on to the third part. So now what we're going to try and figure out is what is the total size of the cache? Let, let's take a look at that. And for that, we can actually leverage um, sequence three. And what we're doing here is we're really going to look at, um, basically, how, given that we have a particular associ uh, associativity, how would the cache be organized in terms of the total number of sets, and then use that information to figure out how would cache blocks hit under that total number of sets, because now we have some interset differences in how data is being stored. So let's take a look at the, the two options that we have. 
So it can either be 256 bytes or 512 bytes. And we know that we have eight byte cache blocks. We, we figured that out in the first part of the problem. So let's write our sets again. We have 32, or 32 blocks. Let's write our blocks, or 64 blocks. Now the question is, um, and, and in fact, we also have the associativity of the set. So now we can figure out the number of sets. The number of sets is equal to the number of blocks in the cache divided by the size of each set. Do you see how that transformation happens? You can think of the limit case. If you just have one set, then the number of sets will be like really long. They'll all be one block wide. And you'll have a, if you just have a one, one way in each set, the total number of sets that you have will be equal to the total number of blocks in your cache. If your sets are, if your associativity is like super huge and is equal to the number of blocks that can fit in your cache, then you'll have like a really long, one single really long set that holds all of the blocks in your cache. All of the variations in between can be found in a similar way just by dividing by the number of sets, so, or the, num the amount of associativity. So if we have 32 blocks and we have four ways, this gives us eight sets. Similarly, 64 blocks divided by four ways, 16 sets. And so, so this is basically the main thing that you need to realize to be able to solve this question. I've gone through a couple of the ways that addresses map to sets. What you basically have to do now is you have to say, OK, given this many sets, that's going to be the parameter that I use in my modulo operation to figure out how addresses map to sets. And then you just go through the example, and you go through each of the addresses and figure out how would these map to each different set, which ones would hit. Um, given that some of the addresses are repeating and things like that. Okay, so this is the main thing to keep in mind is how you, how you figure that out. So I'll let you look at the solutions for that. And then the last one is replacement policy. And again, by this point, these, these kind of have a similar way of solving each one. You basically use the associativity, the parameters that you figured out before, and you constrain the problem more and more, and then just run the example sequence that we give you to figure out what actually would happen in the cache. So for this example, now we basically know almost everything in the cache. We have one sequence that we haven't used, and we have two replacement policies to choose from. We can just almost just plug in those addresses and figure out where they would map try the two different replacement policies. And as soon as we find that one actually works, then we can go ahead and use that one. OK? So at first, when you look at a problem like this, it can look pretty daunting, because you don't really know anything about, uh, about the system itself. A lot of forward engineering problems would give you these parameters and then say, what would be the hit rate of this particular sequence? But the type of questions that you'll probably see on the midterm and final like to go the other way around. We'll give you sort of the end outcome of a forward type problem, and we'll ask you to reverse engineer it and figure out parameters of the system. Okay. So speed is key, but you also want to be smart about how you're eliminating certain portions of the problem and recognize exactly what's going on in terms of the, the system that we're using, in this case, caching. OK. So if you have additional questions on the homework assignments, please, you know, and you have been, show, show up to office hours, show up to lab. I want to transition now and go over to um, lab six. And we can answer any questions on lab five. But what I really want to get to is give you that head start on lab six with some information about it. Are there any questions on lab five? Yeah. Uh, in what situations does the reference simulator flush? Because most of my run the branch tests, uh, there are uh, branch, I can't remember if it's branch equals or branch not equals, mm -hmm. has three branch instructions, mm -hmm. several of which are not taken uh, and should therefore be predicted correctly on a, uh, an uninitialized branch predictor. Um, but uh, the reference simulator flushes three times, and my simulator only flushes 
the reference simulator flushes any time there's a BTV in this, even if it can predict So I tried that, and that makes other things, um, other other parts of it uh, flush way too often. So th this sounds like it might be a good question if we sat down and looked at the exa exact code that you're, you're looking at. Um, why don't you go to Yungu's office hours or lab later on today and sit down with him and, and take a look at the code okay. and figure out what's going on there. So it should be doing exactly what's specified. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's something that's going on that's more subtle that, okay. that, that he can help you figure out. Okay. Is that OK? Yeah. OK, cool. OK, so any other questions on lab five? OK, let's, let's jump into lab six. So what you've implemented up until this point is kind of a basic core model, but that's where we drew the line, was at the boundary of the core and its closest components. So what we, have, what we had in lab five, what you're working on right now is you have the CPU, which we gave you. This has some sort of branch prediction logic that you're adding on right now. And it also has some basic caches that you're implementing based on what you've learned. There's a level one instruction cache and a level one data cache. So this is, this is lab five. Okay. okay, relatively straightforward. What we're going to start to do, though, in lab six, is you're going to venture outside this magical dotted line and go into main memory proper. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at some of the structures that we've been talking about in lecture and how they interact with the lab that you already have. You'll be building on top of it. OK, so the first structure that we'll introduce is something called, well, this one is still pretty familiar to you. We're basically adding another level of caching. So after you, if you miss in the, the right now there's separate L1 instruction cache and L1 data cache, what you'll do is you'll begin to access a unified, so both instructions and data will reside here, L2 cache. This is a bigger cache. We're having both instructions and data intermingle in here we might be able to afford more associativity than we had for these caches because we're dealing with longer latencies. It's less tightly coupled to the processor. But at the end of the day, you'll have this L2 cache right here. And the L1 caches will re request data from the L2 cache. The L2 cache will fill data. This is called a fill operation into the L1 caches. So, and I believe the assumption is both of these can access this cache at the same time. You can also return information at the same time. I believe we don't impose any constraints on how many ports there are in the L2. So that's called a cache fill. Um, what happens if you miss in the L2? Well, as we've been talking about, you have to go, you have to venture out further and start accessing main memory. Now, it's not just as simple as connecting the L2 cache up to some sort, let, let's, let's duplicate this up here because we're going to go even deeper, L2. It's not as simple as just wiring it up to some DRAM and things just work fine. Because remember, we're, as we're learning about DRAM, it's not accessed like a cache. You, if you, you don't just give it an address and wait a certain number of cycles and then it gives you back its data. There's actually a protocol that you use to access DRAM. It has activate commands. It has read write commands. It has a command called precharge. We'll talk about a couple of these. So you can't just wire it up this way. You need A, some sort of buffering to buffer requests that miss in the L2 and are waiting to be serviced in DRAM. And you need two, some sort of arbiter between those requests and the DRAM modules itself. So, the buffering area are called misstatus handling registers. Misstatus 
handling. Registers or MSHRs. This is basically a table that's storing outstanding misses from the L2, whether the entries are valid and maybe other metadata that we need to keep track of. But we buffer the L2 misses in, this MS, in these MSHRs while they're being serviced in DRAM. So then what happens? Well, we have these MSHRs, and we also have some logic. Remember I mentioned there's also this arbitration that goes on called the memory controller. The memory controller is really the module that's responsible for issuing all of these commands to the DRAM main memory on behalf of the processor. So let's draw, let's fill in DRAM now. Where you're going to implement DRAM. You'll have a memory module, and this module will have eight banks, for example. This memory controller will be issuing commands to the DRAM. What commands will it be issuing? Well, let's take a look at how you would operate a bank. We're still in lab six. So here's a blown up view of a bank. You have some sort of memory cell array. Now this is where we actually draw that dotted line. You don't have to implement some sort of DRAM device technology. But we will ask you to manage each of the banks' as row buffers. Remember the row buffer? Do you, what, what's the job of the row buffer? Do you, do you remember that from lecture? That's like a cache that stores the most recently accessed row out of the Yeah, it's like a very simple, small cache that stores the most re recently accessed row. Remember, the, the array is actually, the cell array is, is organized in terms of rows and columns. Why, why do we just store one here, though? Why, why not multiple? Is there a reason why we don't want to just add more cache space onto the row buffer? Two row buffers use LRU, add a couple of bits. Yeah. Can you actually have more than one row active? Is that? Uh, so in current DRAM modules, you can only activate one row. Like you can only have one row that's activated inside the row buffer. Now, you can actually pipeline row activations, but they're orchestrated in such a way that you'll never have two activations that finish at the same time and store their data in the row buffer. There might be ways to, to pipeline some of these, but for this, the, the system that we'll be assuming Let's just assume that you can activate a single row at a time. So, so you can only activate a single row, but that doesn't mean that you can't use additional space in the row buffer. You could activate one row, it'll get filled in here, activate another one, and hey, it'll get filled in right alongside this first one. Now if you want to access the first one again, its data is already there. You can get some locality. So why don't we add more row buffers? Yeah. Like, if you keep adding them in, and it's just looking like the block itself, and like it can add complexity and access time. And it can add complexity, it can add access time potentially. So let's talk about access time. It can add access time, but remember, we're already at the latency of DRAM, for example. The cells might take hundreds of cycles to access. If you tack on an additional two cycles for every miss in the row buffer, maybe it's worth it for saving all of those many, many cycles that you would have spent accessing the array. So if you have good row buffer locality, for even from a latency perspective, it might actually make sense. But complexity is an entirely different story. If you look at modern DRAM dies, what you'll find is that these cells in the row buffer, they're basically SRAM cells, and SRAM cells have to be pretty big compared to one capacitor and one transistor potentially for a DRAM cell. So if you look at a die photo of a DRAM chip, what you'll find is that a lot of the area is actually just spent with these row buffers. What does it mean to add more row buffers? Well, now you're adding, maybe you're making larger dies. That's more expensive. Maybe you reduce your yield 
because now you just have more components on your die and a larger area that could potentially fail. The thing with DRAM is it's a very cost-driven industry. So this is one of the places where theory meets the real world. So if you want to keep the costs down, you have to figure out the design point where you get the most benefit for the least amount of complexity. And for modern devices, they've sort of settled with this one row buffer model. But that's an interesting to consider as other ways. OK, so let's get back to the context of the lab. We're going to have one row buffer. And this is where we sort of draw the line between what you need to implement. Now, this is the system. Let's go through three sort of things that I want to, or, or two additional things that I want to highlight about this system that you'll be implementing in the lab. So the first thing is we have this bank, great. I mentioned there's some sort of protocol that we've discussed in class. But what, how does that actually interact with this bank? Well, let's talk about that for a second. There's going to be four different commands that you'll be implementing. Right now, I believe that they all have the same latency. So that's just something to keep in mind. In a real system, they could be potentially different. But there's, there's um, four different commands. And these commands are issued at different points in time, depending on the state of the bank. So for example, you could have three different states that are possible in this bank. One state is, let's say I have row 3 in the row buffer. One potential option is I could access data from row 3. What happens here? I access it directly from the row buffer. No need to access the bank. That's called a row buffer hit. Good. Another possible option is I could have an access that comes in to row 4. Row 4 isn't located in the row buffer. What happens now? Well, we'll have to actually write back the contents of row 3 into the DRAM array, read in the contents of row 4, and then service the initial request. It's called a row buffer conflict or row buffer miss. Another option that's also possible is, what if I just turned on the device or I'm using a policy that occasionally writes back the contents of the row to the cell, and I don't have any row located in my row buffer? It's just empty, basically. It's invalid. What happens then if I request row 5? Well, I, have to, I don't have to write back the contents of the row buffer to the array. I just have to go read in row 5 and perform the access that I would have otherwise. This is called, um, what do we call it in the lab? It's just called a closed row buffer access. So these are the different states that your bank can be in when you're operating it. Let's look at some of the commands that operate on these different states. So I mentioned up there that there are four commands. Sorry, those are next to the states. There's three states and there's four commands. Let's look at the commands themselves. We have something called activate, abbreviated act. And activate accesses the contents of the cell array for a particular row and brings it into the row buffer. This is going to the cells. This command typically takes a while because we actually have to access the data that's in those cells. So it gets a row of data. There's two other commands that'll look hopefully familiar to you. There's a read command, which reads a particular column of data from the row buffer. Remember, memory is organized in terms of rows and columns. A read command will read one of those columns. 
Similarly, we have a write command, which writes a column of data. And then there's this other command that you might not have heard of before called precharge, which will abbreviate pre. What this is actually doing is it's performing that operation that I talked about when we need to change to a different row. It writes back the contents of the row buffer to the cell array. So precharge, write back row buffer contents. Why do we need to do this? Well, let me give you the simple example. We, we modified the contents of the row buffer. So if we performed a write to the row buffer, we definitely need to update the cell array. What if we didn't update anything? Why don't we just use a dirty bit and only perform a precharge when the contents of the row buffer are dirty? Why can't we do that? So yeah, so it basically boils down to, because we're using DRAM technology, dynamic random access memory, what makes it dynamic? What makes it dynamic is that we're using capacitors, and over time, the charge that's stored in those capacitors will leak out. It'll drain, because we can't just cut them off from the rest of the, the circuits. So what happens is, if we read the row into the row buffer, in fact, we need to drain the contents of those capacitors in order to be able to sense what data is located there. So when you perform an activate, that's the same thing as taking the charge that's stored in the capacitors in that row, draining it all out. You lose all data in that row when you do an activate, but it's buffered in the row buffer. What that means for this system is that regardless of whether you read the data from the row buffer or wrote the data, you always have to write the data back into the contents because the capacitors were draining. Yeah. So if you activate a row and you somehow lose it, mm -hmm. it's gone? Yes. So if you activated a row and you let's say you had some sort of, I don't know, alpha particle or something that strikes the row buffer and flips a bit, you have no way of knowing in regular DRAM if you know, the contents of the row buffer is different from the contents that was stored. If you use error correction somehow, maybe you store a parity for each row that's not stored in the DRAM itself. So if you had, if you modified this bank and now it has DRAM and some dedicated storage that's used for parity bits, now you could actually detect those changes before you write back the data to the row. But we're not assuming any of that for this lab. An interesting thing to mention is because this is just a remnant of the device that we're using, DRAM, if we actually didn't use DRAM, if we used some sort of memory that doesn't have this property where it drains the data, SRAM is, a, is an example, but SRAM is really expensive. But let's just say SRAM for the sake of explanation. We wouldn't actually have to worry about this. If the data was actually persistent in the cells, then we could just keep track of whether it was modified in the row buffer and write it back. That's just a brief aside. OK, so these are the four commands. And what I've been telling you is now we're, it, it, what I've been building up to is how do we actually map these commands to these different states that the row buffer can be in. So here's how they map. Let's take a look at our states again. If we have the simple case, a row buffer hit, Actually, maybe, maybe you might know how to use these commands. How would you map these commands to a row buffer hit? What would you do? Just perform the reader write on the row buffer, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is the little notation that I'm going to use, read or write. Pretty simple, right? You just have this simple interface for accessing the row buffer. Let's do one that's a little bit more complicated. What if we have? Um, I don't know, a closed row buffer. Can you figure out what commands you would need to do to manage a closed row buffer? Yeah. 
array. Yeah, so the data is not located in the row buffer yet. We want to request it from the cell array, place it in the row buffer, and only after we've done that, we can just issue the command as if it were located in the row buffer itself. So we would need to do an activate, and then we could do our read or write command. Cool. What about a row buffer miss? This is the case where we actually have to exercise all of the commands. In addition to reading the row from the cell array and reading or writing a particular column, we also have to write back the contents of the row that's currently in the row buffer. So we're going to start out with a precharge. That'll write the contents of the row buffer back into the cell array. Then we'll perform an activate because now we want to retrieve a new row that wasn't located in the row buffer before from the cell array. And then we're going to perform our read or write command. This is basically a, a these are, and these are the three commands and how, the three states and how the commands map to them. And this is basically a finite state machine. That's why it's simple enough to be implemented in the hardware. It's just implementing this particular memory access protocol which, I guess just for your own in, uh, background information, this is typically when we talk about like DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, GDDR, you hear these, these names thrown around. These are really referring to different protocols that are used to access different DRAM device technologies. Now, the full-blown protocol actually has many, many, many more commands than what we're exposing in this lab. But I think for the sake of your understanding, these are really the key ones that contribute the most to the latency that you'll be experiencing. Yeah? Are we going to take into like refreshes and stuff? No. So you won't have to worry about intermittently performing refreshes, unless the handout is changed. So I, I'm working off of a copy that was available yesterday, because we actually haven't released the lab. Uh, I took a quick look over the current one, though, and no, I don't think that there's anything to do with refreshes. That would add another layer of complexity. How would you implement refreshes? Actually, <laughs> or activate and recharge. I guess depending on what it's. Those are you have to go through the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. So all you have to do is you just have to have some sort of background logic that every so often, at an interval that's smaller than the worst case time that a cell can drain, go through and just do and activate and pre-charge on every row in your DRAM. Refresh is really bad. So doing that every so often can actually very much disrupt your program's performance. Um, so there's actually a lot of research that's being performed into how to make that more efficient. So one interesting thing to note, this is completely an aside and won't have any bearing on the lab itself, is in these DRAM devices, what you'll typically find is that the cells don't all leak at the same rate. You have some cells that leak within however many you know, milliseconds. I don't know, maybe four milliseconds, maybe microseconds. If it's smaller than a certain amount, the DRAM vendor will actually throw the device away. If it's smaller than some sort of margin that they've built into the device that they can handle with their refreshes, they'll actually just throw it away. And they actually have to test for this when they make the device. Some cells, though, can actually retain their data for seconds or even minutes. Kind of crazy, huh? You think of you have this capacitor, and you, you, with, normally with DRAM, you think it's just draining very quickly. But there's some cells that can actually retain their data for longer. So why do we punish the system by refreshing everything at the worst possible interval? Well, historically, that's been because we just can't predict which cells are going to retain their data for longer versus shorter when we make the device. So manufacturers build in margins, and device designers just refresh it according to the worst case scenario that they could have. Some recent research has looked at profiling the DRAM and figuring out what are the cells that actually can retain their data for a long time and refreshing those more infrequently. This can save power and performance and all those other things. Just an interesting side note. Um, you won't have to worry about this for the lab. OK. So 
Last thing I wanted to talk about that'll hopefully help you get started on this lab is the only thing now, I think, that remains to be a black box, that, that's currently a black box, is that memory controller up there. So let's try and take a look into that in a little bit more detail. And we'll do that. Okay. So, yes. With regard to the MIS status handling registers. Yes. Since that's used whenever you have more than one MIS at the same time, mm -hmm. doesn't that kind of imply then that you're doing for this we'd have to be doing some kind of out of execution? Because in the previous lab, if you had a MIS, you just stopped and waited for it to filter down. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have to come out of execution with this. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. So, so out of order execution in terms of how the requests are scheduled. So in the memory controller, how you issue those requests to memory might actually not be the same as the order in which they're issued from the processor. So, so that's, that's what I wanted to talk about next and finally, which is uh, memory uh, scheduler policies. We'll have you implement one of these, which I'll add is fairly simple, but there's others that exist. The memory scheduler is this special circuit that resides in the memory controller that's in charge of figuring out what is the most efficient, for some definition of efficient, way of servicing memory requests that are outstanding in the system. Here's one way, a very simple memory scheduler that you could implement. First come, first serve. As a request is issued from the processor, you issue it to the memory and wait for it to return. If you use first come, first serve, you actually, unless you're using these for other purposes, you don't need the misstatus handling registers because you're just waiting until one request returns before you accept another request. You can just stall the pipeline and wait until the first request returns. What's bad with first come, first served in the memory that we talked about? What's bad with first come, first serve? Any ideas? It's a little bit subtle. Yeah, Andrew. It may not have like the locality. Like if you could thrash back and forth, I guess, between like one row buffer and another row buffer. Yeah, exactly. So if you're accessing the same bank and your request, let's say you have the following um, access pattern and you're using first come, first served. You want to access row 0, and then row 1, and then row 0, and then row 1, all within, let's say, the amount of time it takes to issue a single, to service a single memory request. So you issue a request for row, reading from row 0, and in the however many cycles it takes to service that, all of these requests queue up, let's say, or they could queue up if we gave them the resources to. What would happen in a first come, first serve memory scheduler would be it would do the, so it would be a closed row initially. It would do activate read from row zero at the particular column. Then it would pre-charge row zero, activate row one, read, let's just say they're reads, pre-charge row one, activate row zero, read, and so on. So you have this pre-charge that's happening every time you switch the row here. And you're doing this because you're obeying a strict order. But what if, what if you actually just waited a little bit? I mean, memory latency is typically pretty long. What if you just waited and let some requests queue up and reordered them to obtain maybe higher throughput or better locality? So let's say that this was the first come, first served order. But what if we swapped a couple of these requests? What if we swapped this request for row 0 and row 1? What does that mean now? Well, we still have a closed row buffer, and then we would need to activate and read row 0. But take a look. The next time we perform a, a request, we don't have to pre-charge anything. We don't even have to activate anything. We can just perform the read directly from the row buffer. 
Then, of course, we switch the row, but we can get this same property. What we call this request here is it's a request that's ready to issue given the contents of the row buffer. We don't really have to do any special manipulation of the memory to issue this request. So this is a ready request. And in fact, the memory scheduling policy that you'll be implementing is something called first ready, first come, first served. What does that do? It does exactly what we just described. It looks through the available requests in the MSHRs and finds out of those requests which ones are ready to issue to a bank, issues those, and then as a tiebreaker, perhaps, or after there are no requests that are ready to issue, it uses first come, first serve. What that's if you have a request that's right? Mm -hmm. Then aren't you supposed to read in the correct order if you have a read at that same spot? Uh, so you're, I, I guess, I don't understand. If you like have a right to row zero, mm -hmm. you couldn't read before you write. Or does that happen? Does that happen? You couldn't. So the thing is, we're dealing with all of these accesses at the row granularity. So if you're writing to a different row, then you won't, there, it's guaranteed that you won't be reading from that different row by reordering these requests. So, so let me give you a, a concrete example that I think illustrates your concern. So let's, instead of just having row numbers, let's say we have a read to row zero, and then we have a write to the same column in row zero, and then, I don't know, a read, row one, write, row one. Or I guess going back to the example we had before, it would be something like this. Read, row one, write, row zero. This doesn't, this doesn't illustrate the concern that you have, but I just want to establish some sort of baseline that we have here. So in this case, if we were using first ready, first come, first serve, we would read from row zero, observe that there was a write to row zero, and swap it for this read request to row one. So these would get swapped, but we would be reading the data in the correct order. Now the concern, so between rows, we don't have to worry about this because rows will get swapped out. So reads to a different row will definitely have been written back to the memory before we read them. The concern I think that you might have is, what if you have something like, uh, is it possible, let's, let's, uh, let's move this back up, write to row zero, read to row one. Is this ever possible? Rearranging a write to the row before a read to the same row. Is this possible under first ready, first come, first serve? The answer is no, and here's why. Because, because these are already writing to the same row, it's a tie in terms of the first ready aspect of the policy. And first come, first served ensures that all reads to a particular row will happen before any writes that would have modified the data that they're reading, okay? So you don't have to worry about cases like that if you just implement the policy. That's a good question. OK, so like we said, this is called first ready, first come, first served, and we'll typically abbreviate it as FRFCFS. OK. And that's your managing po management policy. There's different policies that you could use that optimize for different aspects of the system. First ready, first come, first served is pretty good for maintaining high bandwidth to your DRAM devices, but it could lead to some cases of starvation for if you have multiple applications now. There could be one that is always accessing the row buffer, where because of this first ready aspect, it kind of hogs the row buffer, and another application can't issue its request to a different row that maybe don't have good row buffer locality. Remember way back to the first lecture of this course where we talked about GCC and MATLAB? 
Here's what's going on under the covers. It's really something that's happening in the memory scheduler that's causing MATLAB, which is operating on huge, huge matrices, to stream through main memory. And GCC is just trying to traverse some tree of values that it parsed that are interspersed throughout main memory. MATLAB can queue up all of its requests at a particular bank, and GCC just has to wait behind all of those requests before it can actually service its request to a different row. There are other effects, too, that are going on in the system that are more subtle, but this is one contributing factor to that. And we see this a lot in different applications on multi-core systems. Um, yes, so, but you don't have to worry about multi-core systems for this lab. The next lab, you will. And that is going to take a really long time. OK, but for right now, I think you have enough information to get started on lab five. As usual, get started early. And if you have any questions or um, any clarifications, feel free to contact the TAs once we release the description. OK, so we did end early today. That's good. And um, yeah, good luck. Thanks.